church, say amen. 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 We got a special treat here today. We're going to split some sermon time. I hope you enjoy being able to share this with us. Because I've got a very special sermon for the church of the child now. And a uh, newly expanded person uh, that I want to introduce to you today. He's a blessing us uh, to, to lead us in the gospel and then to teach him on the end of it. Uh, my wife and I have had an opportunity to be blessed to, to become close friends with the man I have. Both doctors, math doctors, and their family there. And then Dr. Clark Eastman and I is a, is a, uh, at Justin University as a professor of English there. But most importantly, the thing that I love so much about him is that he and his wife have founded, I believe, founded and started uh, this the chapel ministry for adult, adult chapel ministry at the University, Justin University. And with me, the first lady and several others are going to become a part of that for their not only sharing the word with the adults through the VA program, but now videotaping this ministry so that it can be transferred, transported throughout the campus. And the vision that the Lord is giving is just a powerful thing. And I'm excited to be able to have him come and share with us this morning. And uh, he told me, just, just say, don't, don't say anything, just his humility is amazing. And all the anointing that the Lord has placed on his family. And so without further ado, let's just give Trinity welcome to, uh, to Professor Vargas Matthias. Uh, with uh, with uh, Dr. Love, I'm not 
worthy of that uh, is I was thinking of John the Baptist or someone far greater following me, but I am and I'm pleased to be uh, in this in this uh, uh, spot for a few moments. I see that this is a graduation day. I was uh, thrilled to watch the parade of talents and uh, the great achievers. Uh, uh, so um, um, uh, commendably uh, recognized and for the right reason. Um, the I, I, I wish when I was growing up I, I could fill in their ranks and uh, share some of the merits that they have, they have, and apparently that's a bit too high for me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm, pro pro I'm really happy that uh, they belong to Trinity. I'm going to uh, take you for a few moments into uh, a part of the gospel, uh, and let's see what we can what we can uh, get out of that. Yeah. I am uh, in uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter six, and I'm going to read only some random verses. Uh, this uh, the portion that I'm reading is or has to do with uh, the miracle of loads, uh, the loads, by, you know, feeding the 5,000 and uh, what happen, happens afterwards. You will find this in all four Gospels, so I'm not asking you to concentrate on any particular uh, text. You will find this in Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 6 and uh, Luke chapter 9 and uh, John chapter 6, each with uh, uh, additional additional glimpses on all of them together, giving us a, an enormously uh, complex a story. Much of that is uh, to be perceived and then to be read. But I do not have time to uh, touch upon everything, obviously. But uh, I am going to start with a, a, a little verse here. Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 7 says this. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirit. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money box, but to wear sandals and to and now to put on two two tunics. And uh, well, they do go out and perform great things, and they come back and they give a report to Jesus Christ. And that's found in verse 30, which reads like this. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourself to a desert place and rest for a while. That sounds like graduation to me. <laughs> because they were taught for pretty close to three years. And then they got all the theory, uh, the knowledge of the kingdom of God and the uh, principles of the gospel. And they were also given a little season to apply what they had learned. And they traveled. This was a domestic mission within Israel itself, and they went two by two. And where they went, obviously the teaching was very effective, and teaching is usually, you know, it's a very risky job. Flat out, and, you know, I've seen very few people who say, I want to be, maybe bad advertisement too, <laughs> teaching, teaching is a threat to a lot of people, and a lot of people see that as a boring tiring and so on. So, there has to be a drive for discovery in it if you want to be absorbed. Yeah. All right. Now, these men went out and taught. Hey, it worked. <laughs> they were so happy that they taught. And they had people listening to them. That was an upbeat note. And then they did something else. They uh, laid hands on the sick, anointed them. And it was not just leaving the oil on their body. Something else happened. You know, they were healed. Yeah. And better yet, they were even demons. There's no 
for lack of them, you know, demons, <laughs> and they were cast out. Yeah. And they came back and told them, Lord, you know what? I thought, we thought only you could do such things. But you transferred that ability to us. Something seems to work because we are the kind of guys who could not even understand the parable of the sower and the seed. Remember, we asked, we asked for a second, interpret, a second interpretation, a third interpretation, and so on. But this doesn't work. And Jesus said, good. This is time to celebrate. And tonight we're going to have an even real secret plan. He had a secret plan to have a graduation dinner. <laughs> and he said, let's do it a quiet place. Very sarcastic. It is impossible for Jesus Christ to find a quiet place because everywhere you see Jesus Christ retreating, people overtake him. You know, the people in good things sometimes weaken, in good things in the spirit world, so it would seem that we could overtake God. You know, they were ahead of him at that location where he was going to reach, and Jesus was not offended at all. He was moved by compassion and he began to teach them. And there was another note to this story. This is not a, you know, a day of, of um, giggle and clapping for Jesus Christ. There is something else in the background. His cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And he just received the word. And instead of trying to go to that place where his body lay severed or headless, and then to cause him to come back to life, which he could do, he said, I am going to go. I mean, his heart was crushed. And then people gathered around, around him. This sounds like some powerful ministry. Great ministers have their graves hidden, you know, and their pages are unshared. And places of leadership are the loneliest that you can think of. And they never share their grief with others because very few people understand. They come and they begin doing the regular things that he always does. And in the evening he said, you give them something to eat. They drop their dog. What? In this wilderness? We're so far away from them. any marketplace whatsoever. And what do you think? It would cause the state budget to be in to feed them all. <laughs> okay. There's no money. What did I read at the beginning? You go on a domestic mission trip. Take. No. Money. No. Bread. No. Any extras. None of these things threaten God. We have every legitimate excuse as to why we should not do certain things. I saw those brilliant minds graduating from Ivy League places. We have every excuse not to finish even high school. If you're looking for excuses. But you're brilliant people. You know, God has his hand moving you. And see what the result is. All right? Jesus said, I mean, he didn't need the information. Jesus said, see them in fifties and hundreds, manageable numbers. You take charge of the units. And he broke. And in the breaking, they were growing, they, you know, they was multiplying. And in the survey, nobody, nobody was looking back. It was just multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. Because if God has a single seed, he can produce a grand field. And out of the field, he will produce feeds. Because he does not, he just need the star to see that thought. Even that he created. Even that he created. So, he is not threatened by the lack of, seeming lack of resources or the tightness of the budget Come on. and you know the story already so I don't want to overwork it but there, there was something that is said in the gospel of John the other three do not say that Come on now. John said 
6.12. John said, Do not gather up all the fragments. Do not leave a single crumb. Don't lose a single crumb. And they didn't know why he said that. They gathered it up. Everyone had a basket full. That is good enough compensation for the labor. And then, evening came. The evening came. He said, you go to the other side of the lake. And each one is hugging his basket and is going on board the boat. You see that? And then he is heading to the opposite direction to the mountain to pray. Because John the Baptist is still here. Remember, heaviness of heart for his cousin and he's praying quarter one quarter two and quarter three of the night he's praying and quarter two quarter three these men are rowing in the middle of the ocean three miles about three to four miles from the shore they are rowing and straining at the oars and making no progress this is like a night in which no man can work. Well, and if any man could work, he wasn't getting anywhere. The storms were like gaping graves. They were just about to devour him. I mean, de devour them. And it said, while he was in the mountain and they were screaming at him, he saw them. What? He saw them. Was he using binoculars? <laughs> at night. At night, he saw them and he decided to, to come marching over the waves. And he did. And do you know what happened? I have to skip and go on. There is something said in Mark that others do not say. That's why the gospel is so. It is like playing chess. If you know how to play it, and I don't. You know. <laughs> but you bring the motions and the math of things and the intricacies. My goodness, it is that. Mark says in uh, Mark 6 and 52, very subdued statement. And uh, I read from 51 also. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled full. For me, so big part. They had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Well, it sounds like a very innocent statement. They had not understood about the loaves. What loaves? The loaves that they had served to the people, yeah. And the loaves that they had eaten, yeah. But the loaves that they had saved in the basket. And what was the instruction when they were when they when they carried, when they gathered these? Do not lose a single crumb of it because this had been touched and spoken over by the divine voice. Mm. Mm. This is unsinkable bread. Mm. And this, the, this bread is on board. Ooh. And there is no way with the bread laid in on it, this boat is going to sink. Mm. And the minute Jesus got into the boat, they realized, Man, it would have been, it was absurd to have all that panic. Oh. Because he had told us two things. One, you go to the other shore. Because if he had the shore as a destination, that, that is a foregone conclusion that we would be there no matter what happens in the middle. And second, this, the, these 12 baskets are rocking in the storm. You know, but they are still on board. There was not one morsel of it lost. You see? And, and, 
You know, remember these people, these very same men said, send the people away. It is late at night. Or it is getting toward, you know, dark. Well, isn't it ironic that God had sent the people away? That Jesus had sent the people away? And they're all by themselves. There's no one to help. They said that the other place is wilderness. Now this is the worst wilderness in the night. You see? Wonderful irony in their experience. Yes. Now, I need to hurry. And uh, this, if this is a graduation evening and the time following, graduation typically is called commencement. That word always bothered me. I thought it was culmination. You know. <laughs> but you, you commence your life. But here, Christ says, you, you, you commence to continue. Yes. You're doing a greater labor now. You brought a great performance report earlier, 20, less than 24 hours earlier. But now you have a greater test. Oh, you oh. graduate only to perform greater things yet. Yes. And your next greater test is just three months away. And uh, the man in the mountain, sees all your emotions and the intensity of your struggle and the storms strain but they will leave after setting the stage and therefore what? hold on to the breath you can't sink unless it also sinks thank you
see things. <coughs> the pursuit of God, the pursuit of wisdom will always lead to an end with the word of God. Solomon would ask him, the Lord would ask Solomon what he wanted. If you had a choice to get anything else in the world, you kind of ask the question to the graduates. If you, if you, had a, if you could do something uh, and you weren't paid for it, if you, could, you could just, if you didn't, money would never factor and you wanted to do it, what would you pursue? What is, there, what is that you would want? Well, Solomon said, give me wisdom. Give, give, me, give me your wisdom. Give me, give me the relationship with you that gives me the knowledge that I need of you and the ability to practically apply that to my life journey. You said beautifully, little well, rich fellow, but I didn't forget people. <laughs> and so when he, when, he, when he says to the, to the listener, when he says to the, not just the graduate, anyone who's walking this journey of life, that if there's any, if and it surely is true, yeah. mm -hmm. that there is any deficiency of wisdom, there may be levels of wisdom that you've obtained, we've all obtained as we grow closer to the Lord through Christ Jesus, and we now find ourselves living out, experiencing that, uh, that attempt to live out our lives, in relationship with Christ, but it says there will be, there will be as you walk, as you, as you continue the journey, you'll recognize that there are areas of deficiency. Have y'all been here too long already? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, you, and the, a, part of, a part of wisdom is coming to an understanding that there, there are areas of deficiency. Am I right about that? Yeah. The, more, the more students, Bible Institute students, the more you find that you study this word, the more that you'll understand what you don't know about this word. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit here, but I love, I love the Bible students. I love Bible students. Uh, the tendency is that once you, you dive into a little bit of this word, I'm, not, I'm talking about y'all because I am one. We, dive, we first dive into this word. Let me, let me talk about me. I remember when I first dived into this scripture in seminary, and uh, it was just immersing myself in this word. The Lord had called me to preach. And I said, Lord, you sure you're calling the right guy? Then uh, after, after we came to a clear understanding that, yeah, he's talking to me and, and I need to pay attention and get on with what he's told me to do. I said, Lord, you know, you, you got to, you got to prepare me for this thing. I mean, you know, the last thing I'm thinking about doing is standing up here and trying to proclaim your word and, and making us both look foolish. And so I burst into seminary study and they just were, they were just filling you up with you know with information. And I found myself, I remember the first time I went out, went back to my hometown, my little hometown in Virginia, to preach the to preach a message at my little home church that I grew up in. And, you know, back then before the Lord took all the writing, I was writing out my sermons. And so I got up there and I started reading this message to the to the congregation. And it dawned on me about two minutes, two or three minutes into the message that I had written this thing like it was a theology <coughs> paper. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I actually thought I knew something <laughs> standing up in front of this congregation. And, you know, I had five, six, seven syllable words I was tossing out there. You know, nobody interested in eschatology. They wanted to know what at least they didn't let the word wasn't when they hit them home, you know, you had to break that stuff down. And so the tendency, the tendency was to think that I had actually, that I actually had this grasp upon this great deal of knowledge. But I had, <coughs> I had not obtained an inkling of the wisdom that was necessary in life. And so there was a deficiency there. And the first part of the learning curve is understanding that there, there are points of deficiency in our lives. And, and, and if you don't recognize that there's a deficiency, deficiency in your wisdom tank, then you're going to think that you can go out here and operate in this world system and somehow master the world system without the, without the, proper, without the proper preparation from God. And when you do that, the, the enemy will take that pride and take that, that, that arrogance and take that, self, that false sense of self-assurance and twist you, into, uh, twist you into humanistic knots, if I can place, place it that way. And so the text says, first of all, you need to understand that there's a deficiency. Secondly, you need to understand that there's a remedy. The remedy is ask. I need, there's a need, ask. The remedy comes from a divine source. All wisdom comes, all true wisdom comes from God. Paul would say it this way, worldly wisdom is just like foolishness, first Corinthians. That's foolishness to God. So if you're wrapping yourself up in the wisdom of the world, you, you're not only, you're, you're, in a, you're, you're in a sand trap and you're digging yourself deep. 
Does that make sense? But I like the fact that it says, ask, it says it comes from God, and God will bless you abundantly. Uh, the term in the King James says he'll bless you liberally. Uh, the, the Greek grabs him over, whatever, he'll, he'll do this in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a giving, ungrudging fashion. That's what the Greek is trying to get. He's trying to get it. God is giving it to you joyously. He's giving it to you graciously. He's giving it to you in abundance. And he's not doing it grudgingly. He's not, he's not trying to hold any of that wisdom back. He wants you to have it. And the pursuit students will always, if you're honestly and sincerely pursuing, pursuing wisdom, it will always lead you to the source. God, the creator, and his word. And he's willing to bless you. Secondly, verse 6 says it this way in the Amplified. Only it must be in faith. King James is up there. That he asked with no waver. There is no hesitating and no doubt. For the one who wavers, who hesitates and doubts, is like the billowing surge out of sea, out of sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. It's kind of like being on that boat, Dr. Matthew. Being tossed and asking the question, Lord, where is your Aren't you, don't you even care that we're out here suffering, we're out here journey? But the Jesus would say, well, now, where's your faith? Why are you fearing? Where's your faith? I love the way you touched on this. So I tell you, you're going to make me preach this thing before I leave. Because the outcome, the, the end result is already guaranteed before you started the journey. I wasn't even going there, but since you gave it to me. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's just too rich. It's beautiful. And so the second life lesson is this. Is the power to walk in wisdom will always depend on our faith and our fellowship with Christ. Stand firm. It's one thing to ask God and seek the wisdom. Which is practical. But it's another thing to walk in it. Come on, Red. Am I getting close? We spend time with our, with our teens and uh, you do this so beautifully, Reverend Vice, First Lady, and all those that are working. We spend time with our teens not only, not only making sure that they sowing into them the word of God and, and attempting to disciple them to, in ways to apply that word to their environment, to the, to the peer pressure that they're getting on a regular basis, to the situations that they're facing on a regular basis to the to the questions that they're asking us as they're facing this new world scenario that they're in to the to the to the technical and media things and how how they can find themselves out there in the midst of uh, communication levels that you know their information can be all over the place our information can be all over the place and if we're not careful there'll be things out there that we might not have intended to put out there or somebody may put something out there that has nothing to do with who we are you got all this stuff going on out there and, and our, children, our young people who are not only going from high school to college, but from college to, 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 uh, to the workplace, are, are trying to try to manipulate, maneuver their way through this minefield called life. And they're trying to figure out how do I find the answers to the questions of who am I, why am I here, and where am I going? And in the midst of that, they, they, they seek their source of understanding and wisdom in many cases from foreign sources. That means sources that are not aligned with the law. And somebody needs to love them enough to be able to tell them that that's not the answer, baby. That's not what's going to get you, get you the happiness and the joy that you think that you're seeking. We're trying to gird you up. We're trying to help gird you up and equip you so that when you leave this little high school setting here and launch out into this university setting out here, which is, which is unless you're going to a Christian school, isn't going to have anything to do with Christ. I didn't want to hear that. And you'll have to, you'll have to, you'll notice you're going to be bombarded by information and, 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 uh, and models, if you will, that will attempt to pull you in a direction that is not, that is not Christ-centered or Bible-based. And so how can we help equip? How can we help equip our young people? And how can we be equipped ourselves as we journey outside, journey from the educational realm into the work realm and all attempt to climb the ladder of the work realm? The word says, you got to ask God for the wisdom you need. 
You got to spend time with the Lord in the Word and let, and let Him live, mature you in an understanding and an application of the Word of God. And then, it's not, because it's not just about getting head knowledge, you're going to be flooded with information. And if you listen, if you go into a secular environment, in my time, I still got some time. Stay with me. If you go into, a, if you go into this <laughs> secular, humanistic environment, they're going to flood you with information that will be anti-Christ and this form and this foundation and this formula. So how are you going to, what is the measuring stick, I need to ask the question, that you're going to use a standard that you're going to be able to lay out in, in your life journey that you can measure all this information you're getting from, sec, from, from, from some professors who don't know the Lord and from some environments where the kids are trying to pull you in the places that you know you got no business going. How, what, what is it that you're going to lay out as a standard that you can measure and make a decision by? It's the Word of God. Yes. It's the relationship with Christ Jesus. And he says, the, the, the danger is that all of this information flowing at you will, make, will tend to make us waver. Make us blow in the wind. I know what I, oh, Reverend, I know what you told me when we were in the jam session. But I'm now down here at the University of this and that. And my first time on campus. Let me tell you, baby, you, you're not the only one that's been there. <laughs> and, 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 and some of us have walked that walk and have survived. It might just have a little bit of wisdom, a little practical wisdom we can share with you about where the fires are and how hot they can burn. And a part of wisdom is if I know that the fire is hot and I talk to the Lord, and I know that it will burn on me if I step into that place, then why? Because my friend told me to step in there, should I just step in there? To see how much hot fire I can stand? Or do I, do I apply the principles and precepts of the Word of God and say, now wait a minute, that's not who I am. That's not why God's got me here. And that's not His plan for my life. So, rather than you hearing from the bishop up here a whole lot of thou shalt nots, Why not just hear from the word of God that he will bless you with wisdom, yeah. generously, yeah. abundantly, yeah. without any grudging, without yeah. any attempting to hold back from you. The Lord's not trying to hold, any, hold it back from you. He wants you to be blessed in abundance. Free, free. And that, and that the, the, part of, the part of the growth process is that, that we need to, as we grow in our faith, be, there'll be less of a tendency to doubt and fear. Now he goes with human. God designed us. He knows we're human. Doubt and fear is a part of the fallen nature. So we're going to find ourselves in situations where doubt's going to creep up, fear's going to creep up, wavering's going to creep up. But he also has a remedy for that. Because you, you, you're not going to be able to break yourself through from the relationship if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You're, you're in his hands, so you're not going anyplace. So how are you going to handle the fellowship component of this? Yeah, he says, I, I, I'll see you through the valley of the shadow of death itself. And you will not have to fear any kind of evil because I'm with you. I'm going to be walking with you, talking with you, putting a head of protection around you. I've got a plan and purpose for you. And when you come through, even if you fall down seven times, come on, yeah. the faith in the Lord will be enough. Yeah. Mm. Get back up again. So I just came by to, to give you a quick word of encouragement. On your way to college, on your way from undergrad to graduate school, on your way out of graduate school into the work environment. That uh, this is a th this really is a battlefield. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat this thing for you. I love you too much to, to sugarcoat this thing. Come on, Red. They're going to be they're going to be some. There could be some storms in between the time the Lord used you to feed 5,000. Can I go ahead and just a little bit? Tie it together if you don't mind me, Dr. Matt. 
From, from the time you got the exhilaration of seeing God work a powerful miracle, you never thought you'd even get through high school anyway. You know? <laughs> so when he got you out and got you into a college, and now you're doing something powerful, you know, I just finished feeding the, the 5,000 with a few loaves and some fish, and I got happy about that to the moment that now you're facing the turbulence of the sea that you're in, you know, calling it whatever, the college, university, or whatever setting you're in, and now everything around you is swirling, and it looks new, and the first time you're independent, ain't nobody looking over your shoulders, mom and daddy's not standing right beside you, you actually got, you know, you actually don't have to be home at a certain hour, and you think you're grown. Ain't paid one bill yet. And in the midst of that moment of, of self-induced independence and, and pride, you know, the enemy is just swooping, swirling around and saying that this looks like easy prey right here. All I got to do is set a few little temptations out in front of that. I can pull him or her on in a pathway very quickly there. And the Lord is saying, now, but I'm still going to use even your falling down to, your, to my glory and to your good. So when you cross through the turbulent seas, Understand that he will get you to the other side. But he wants your faith to be less wavering. Less doubtful. He wants us to understand that when, when he's got a plan for your life. And a purpose for your life. That he will fulfill it in your life. If you walk with him. We're in the process now. I'm coming home. Of asking, seeking, recognizing my deficiency, asking for wisdom, Lord, to help me through whatever stage of life I'm in in my journey. And then going through the actual process of walking in faith with the Lord. Knowing that there will be high moments, we fed some folk. Knowing there will be difficult moments, the seas are turbulent under my feet. Knowing there will be some fearful moments, yeah, you're sleeping in the boat and it feels like I'm out here struggling on the seas. But knowing that there will absolutely be some blessed moments as the Lord brings us through. And as we look back over our journey, can't you see where God has been in the journey every single moment of the way? Can't you see that? That is a glimpse of wisdom. Look back over his shoulder and see how he's blessed you. Come on, Red. Think about now and see how he's prepared you. And look forward and see how he can utilize you. Let's just pray. Father God, we just want to take this moment and thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. It's so special to be able to spend time with families and these very special people that are moving to a next level of not only academic excellence but spiritual maturity. And so we thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. I thank you so very much for Dr. Matthew and his family. Yes. He blessed us with this powerful word this, this morning. Continue to watch over and bless them in a mighty way. And now as we begin, as we open up the doors, that are always open, but we extend our arms to family, to, to those who would like to come and be a part of your family. We're praying that you will touch their hearts and minds, give them the strength and boldness and the excitement to take them this next step of faith and move to this next level of the journey with you. So as our musicians come, Father, we just give you thanks. We give you praise. And we look forward to the rest of this powerful day that you have in front of us in the days of you. With a special blessing to all who have been able to be with us and those who are not to travel. Jesus, holy, it's a precious day. We pray it all. That all God's people say amen. 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 As the musicians come, we're going to invite you to stand, if you will.